Okay, well, good afternoon or good morning, everyone. My name is Eric Sellers now with Jobs for the Future, also known as JFF. I'm the Senior Advisor and Director of our Center for Apprenticeship and Work-Based Learning. I wanna thank you all for making the time to join us today. Um, we're really excited about this particular webinar. We've done something a little bit different, um, which I'll explain to you shortly, but uh, you know, workforce development, we can learn a lot from the sports industry and workforce development. And when you think about um, our, our national system of sports, particularly at this time during the Olympics, uh, this conversation becomes very real and important. I'm really, I was really excited by uh, Terrence's paper on this. Uh, you'll hear from Terrence Robinson shortly from Cleveland. You'll hear from Brandon Lloyd, Mike from the Cherry Creek School District, and, and Andrea B. Uh, shortly uh, about this uh, concept. But we've done something a little bit unusual. And we've we've asked one of our guest uh, partners, if you will, uh, to join us today to talk a little bit about his thinking, his theory, his philosophy on talent development in the country today, a very important subject for all of us, a particularly important subject um, for youth um, as they figure out talent development systems, how to learn, how to get experience, um, how to get experiential learning, how to make money. There's so many different issues involved in this, but I think uh, Terrence has brought some really ideas, uh, interesting ideas together. Brandon uh, is a professional athlete and can bring some other perspectives into this concept and the other two folks will really um, provide some details on it. So just an exciting opportunity. JFF is pleased to present this information and partner up with one of our partners uh, to do this. Um, it, it's an unusual, um, it's a different look at what we do every day and it's the way we should be looking at that. As many of you know, JFF it's been around for 35, 36, 37 years at the intersection of education, training, and workforce development. Um, I lead our Center for Apprenticeship, and we're doing a lot of work on both adult apprenticeship and youth apprenticeships. And so that's why this youth talent development concept is so interesting to us. We hope you enjoy it as much as we did. Um, I want to thank you for making time today. I'm going to get out of the way and get into the conversation. And at this point, I'm going to pass this to my colleague and deputy director of the Center for Apprenticeship and Work-Based Learning, Deborah Kovis, in our Boston office. Deborah. Hi, Eric. Thank you so much. And thank you all, as Eric said, for joining us this afternoon. Um, the Center for Apprenticeship and Work-Based Learning has been around since 2017. And in these last few years, we've really seen a lot of growth um, in the registered apprenticeship space and a lot of innovation. Um, so, you know, we've been really excited about all these different ideas and ways to improve apprenticeship. But what we haven't really seen or I haven't really seen um, in my decade working on apprenticeship is something that makes me really stop and think about how we approach apprenticeship overall, how it relates to other kinds of talent development. Um, and really just reflect in a, in a broader way on, you know, what we're doing and why. And I'm really excited to have Terrence Robinson join today um, to have a conversation with Brandon Lloyd. Um, you guys are both welcome to join now. Um, Terrence is the Vice President of Workforce Systems Design for the Success Pathway Alliance in Cleveland. Um, and he's done a lot of registered apprenticeship work there, um, which um, as you'll hear in the discussion, really informs, um, you know, his ideas about how apprenticeship, youth apprenticeship in particular, and sports are connected. Um, and importantly, if you haven't read his recent blog yet, how can we make youth apprenticeship a winning proposition? Look to youth sports. I recommend that you check it out on the JFF website. Um, and he is joined by Brandon Lloyd who was, is a retired wide, wide receiver for the NFL. Um, he played on a lot of teams, so I won't list them all. Um, but having um, been a local fan of both the Washington football team and the Patriots, um, I'm especially excited to have him here. Um, and he's now um, a business, and par business partnerships and apprenticeship ambassador for CareerWise, which is based in Colorado and a leading national organization around youth apprenticeship. Um, so thank you both so much for joining us. Um, I'm really excited for this conversation. Um, and just to kick things off, Terrence, can you just start off by presenting um, what the idea is that we're all here to talk about? 
I would love to. And, and thank you, Eric, and thank you, Deborah, and the entire uh, JFF team. And uh, I am honored and privileged to be here to talk about this idea and to talk about the blog, uh, because, you know, at one point in time, I, I felt that I was uh, maybe maybe looking at things a little too radically uh, as far as talent development and, and workforce development was concerned when I started uh, when I started to see the correlations between the sports industry and, and workforce development and talent development. And I said, you know, what, maybe I'm just too much of a. Sorry about that. Uh, maybe I'm just too much of a uh, sports enthusiast and I'm starting to see analogies. But when I started looking, truly looking at our uh, apprenticeships, it was because uh, in a previous role I had with the organization, a uh, manufacturing based organization here in the Cleveland area, I was uh, challenged to build out a, uh, a pre apprenticeship model for high school students. And that pre-apprenticeship model wanted, needed to be based on the European apprenticeship model. Their, the conceptual idea at the time was, how do we take the European apprenticeship model and merge it with the American education system? And I think that that has been a conceptual idea that has been really thought about and how do we do it? And there's been a lot of different iterations uh, unfortunately, things may work in a pocket or may work with one company, one school, but nothing scalable. And so a lot of my research at that time was was looking at what made the European apprenticeship model work and why did it work? And of course, uh, it has to go back to the historical uh, um, from the from a historical perspective, the European apprenticeship model never dissipated from the European education system. It's embedded, whether you're talking about Germany or Sweden or different countries over in Europe. Uh, it is embedded as part of how they develop talent. And I had to come to the conclusion that America just did not have that part of our, uh, 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 a similar thing embedded in our talent, you know, in our education system. We have chosen the more of the liberal arts approach uh, from education as how we develop talent. And so I started saying, because one thing I, I began to understand is that People, uh, educators, parents, community leaders, they were unfamiliar with the word apprentice or the apprentice word, unfortunately, had a negative connotation depending on what community or what stakeholder group you were conversing with. And, and because of previous history, they were like, if you're building out an apprenticeship model, you're building a young person into a um, uh, I, I, I don't want to call it a dead end job, but the sentiment was where are they going to go after they learn that particular skill set for that particular company? What advancement opportunities are there? So what I started, you know, as, as my research began to grow and I started thinking about, it, I said, we have to figure out something that Americans have already bought into that is reflective of the apprenticeship model. And I, I'm a father of, of five children, four boys and one girl. And just like most fathers, when my oldest son was three years old, I gave him a ball. I gave him a football, a basketball, a baseball, a soccer ball, gave him golf clubs. I, I, I gave him every uh, particular, you know, every possible sports option available. I never said, well, you're going to be a golfer. You're going to be a football player. You're going to be a soccer star. But I said, I want you to learn the skill sets and what it would take if that is something you want to pursue. No one ever questioned me on why was I giving my son a football or a basketball or a soccer ball. I gave my daughter a soccer ball, basketball as, as well. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm a non, you know, I, I did it for both my sons and my daughter. So I'm, I'm <laughs> equitable across the board, but no one ever questioned it. And as I started to look at it, I said, you know what? we have our own apprenticeship model. It's just, we've never looked at it through the lens. And when I first introduced it to Deborah, it was our, I called it the sports and entertainment model because I, I believe the arts, because we do the same thing. If you're not a sports person, you do the same thing with pianos, um, with music lessons, with dance lessons. Um, you know, we, we train, we start young, you know, some of our children off playing the piano 
as early as three or four years old, never thinking that they're going to become a pianist when they are playing Carnegie Hall, but you know that that skill set can help, might be the difference when they're applying for college somewhere down the road. So I started to look at it systemically, and that's where the article came from. And it is that we have an apprenticeship model, we just do not call it, it's, but it's the talent development model for sports develop, for youth development in our country. And what we're looking at is that with the national and international talent shortage that many companies have found themselves, the solution is to rethink talent development. My model is looking at how do we follow and how do we take the transferable processes and, and more importantly, the buy-in. How do we create parental buy-in, educator buy-in, community buy-in, employer buy-in, because as Brandon will probably talk to and speak to, you look at the NFL, the NBA, Major League Soccer, Major League Baseball, they all have very strong youth development models. They work, they partner with the, within their communities to help develop youth. They donate to high schools to build out football fields. They bring their coaches and their team and the community engagement department to promote and you create brand awareness. And I'm not going to steal Brandon's son because he, he, he said something that I thought was so uh, added so much more to um, uh, uh, my, my, my strategy, my model and the thought process. But that's where the impetus came from. And, and, and I think if we can step back and start to look at our sports industry as a true industry and we look at their talent development model, it is one of the few industries that never, ever suffers for talent. And every year you have people training and, 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 and investing in themselves to try to get to, to the professional level and to become an employee within those industries. So that's the impetus. Hopefully I didn't go over my five minutes, but I just kind of wanted to give people a, a background and then help them to understand that this is a systemic talent development model and we can begin talking about its application on youth apprenticeship. No, that, that's fantastic. You're totally fine on time um, and really appreciate that context as well as, you know, starting to get into the idea itself. And, you know, you mentioned um, among all the ways of getting buy-in, the value of employers really buying into it um, as well. And Brandon, I think you're one of the few people in the country who's um, seen this from the sports industry side um, and actually you know made it all the way to one of those employers as well as having experienced um, youth apprenticeship and worked with employers in other industries and what as well so um, it'd be great just to hear from you you know in your career um, what's really resonated with you about this idea and then more broadly um, as you've been working in the youth apprenticeship space um, you know what else you've seen that resonates with the connections between sports and youth apprenticeship well, fantastic. Well, uh, thanks for having me, Eric, and thanks, Deborah. Um, and good to see you again, Dr. Robinson. The, the Dr. Robinson article is so enthralling to me because, you know, I've never read anyone's work that articulates the journey to the NFL through the lens of an everyday, you know, uh, uh, average worker. And as I read Dr. Robinson's article, I um, was going down memory lane. You know, when uh, Dr. Robinson talks about um, how major league uh, sport, how major league, uh, uh, how major league sports leagues invest in youth sports, I, was, I immediately flash back to how I participated in the NFL's pump pass and kick competition. And, you know, the Wikipedia page says there's a 56 year long NFL funded program that turned out coaches like Wade Wilson and Andy Reid, you know, once participated in that. And a WNBA player, uh, Kendra Wecker, was listed as one of the famous contestants. And uh, Dr. Robinson, again, uh, also talks about these specialized training camps that target uh, high school athletes. I attended Nike camps. My parents drove me from Kansas City, Missouri to the University of Colorado, Boulder, because that was the closest Nike football camp that I could get to, to get my information on this national publication in order, me, in order for me to get the on the job training that's paid for by my NCAA scholarship at the University of Illinois. And it's because of that 
tra- that that timeline that the NCAA acts as the farm system to the NFL. And there in that farm system, the NFL players, the potential players are vetted properly. There's extensive film on them. And, and then that apprenticeship in the NCAA uniquely qualifies them to play in the National Football League. So I think about it at each level, an athlete gains skills and competencies. And at each one of those levels, I was a rookie again. Uh, I went from a high school senior to a uh, NCAA freshman. I went from an NCAA upperclassman to an NFL rookie. And uh, even at the pro level, it starts all over. So that cycle in the NFL is all rookies are mentored by vets. And then the rookies become vets. And then uh, those uh, the and then the, those rookies who became vets become veterans to a new group of younger players. So the idea is that um, as I'm learning as a rookie, I'm also learning to become that skills person. And uh, my first apprenticeship, uh, you know, in San Francisco in 2003 was behind a player who was not really concerned with advancing, you know, positivity or an inclusive culture. And as a decision maker, you have to understand your personnel and be aware that there's potential saboteurs. So this concept isn't, you know, without its potential pitfalls. And but my second year in the uh, organization, uh, I was a starting wide receiver. And so the organization brought in a 10 year NFL veteran, Curtis Conway. And that's who began to share with me the practice habits, plus the off the field ins and outs and about being a professional athlete. Uh, my third year, the organization brought in another 10 year vet, Johnny Morton, who also helped me understand the uh, monetary responsibility and the value of making plays and uh, and also being a good teammate. You know, so as I gained the skills and the knowledge to become a skilled person in the second half of my career, I became Curtis, Con- the Curtis Conway, the Johnny Morton to a role to a whole bunch of younger players in the National Football League. And I, so apply that lens through the, the workforce. Um, uh, so looking at that through the workforce lens, you know, uh, career wise, Colorado, it's a three year apprenticeship. So in the third year, uh, that apprentice should be passing along information to the uh, younger apprentices who's com- who are coming in and and youth apprenticeship at scale becomes that cycle. So when an apprentice moves up to a supervisor or a manager, then to the C-suite and then an owner, you know, that's how apprenticeship can become as culturally ingrained in society as youth sports. That's that's really great. And um, I never really felt like I had much in common with an NFL athlete. Um, but, you know, really being able to see that connection of you know, everybody has supervisors, having an inclusive workplace culture really is what makes your experience. Right. So, Deborah, I thought you were going to say you played in pump, pass and kick. No, no. Yeah, I I, I was, uh, you know, a really um, I was a team player, but a JV team player uh, in, on my soccer team, um, never really being the leader, but, you know, still valuing the the participation on a team and and hopefully contributing positively to that culture. Um, But it would be great to hear from you also. Were there any elements um, or connections that you've really seen between sports and youth apprenticeship, um, you know, in addition to what Terrence featured in his article, any other, um, you know, thoughts that you you bring when you talk to employers and to students um, to build that connection? Yes, of course. I I think about, uh, think about this. Think about how long men play in minor league baseball, making below minimum wage, you know, for one shot to make it in the bigs, right? Or And the same thing with the NHL farm system. And and also consider this. In the national and, and professional basketball, a player can go have a multi-million dollar career in Russia or China and never play in the NBA. So, you know, what did the NBA do? Well, it invested more in the G League. So the professional sports models also require some some tweaking. So why would a player turn down millions of dollars from the Australian League to play in the NBA? It's because of the brand. And I think about 
that in the context where in the National Football League, you know, there's only 1,700 players on the planet. And then every April in the draft, there's seven rounds, 32 teams. So that's 220, roughly 225 new potential players that can make it into the league. In 2020, there's, there was, you know, 33 undrafted players that made it in, into the, um, in, on the opening day rosters. So, you know, saying that half of those players drafted make it in the first three rounds, and then, you know, those undrafted players, that's roughly 150 players in the NFL that will need to exit either voluntarily or involuntarily. And, you know, the, the LA Times had an article, you know, the first week of July that talked about, you know, there's no labor shortage. It's just a shortage of good jobs. And what the NFL has done is built a brand to where people are clamoring to get into that league. You know, they've done such a good job of, of marketing it. The, you know, the NFL films with this, the, hand, the center's hand on the ball and the sweat dripping on the, on the football, the spiraling ball in the air and the, and the player reaches up and catches it. You know, the, the thrill of victory and the agony of defeat. It's like they've really invested in the imagery and the, the industry and all that, part, that goes around it. So it's not necessarily that you have to participate as a player on the field because the the talent that actually makes it on the field is glorious but now look at what the league has done so there there was once a period of time where young girls thought that they could own they'd have to you know be a player on the field now they're coaches now you know they're gms and leagues now you know there's there's a whole bunch of other industry that surrounds these pro sports leagues that the league has done an amazing job of of marketing now, the leagues look at it where, look at youth sports. There's an infinite amount of young youth sports players. Now, through the workforce lens, there's an infinite amount of 15, 16, and 17-year-olds in the community to invest in through apprenticeship and strengthen your brand uh, just like a, sports pro, like a pro sports league. Great. And... Um, Terrence, I, I had a question for you, but I actually just want to pause here and give you a chance to react to some of what um, Brandon was saying as well. There's just so many great ideas. I don't want to pass by them. Oh, well, um, Brandon and I had a chance to talk uh, last week, and it was one of the greatest conversations and many of the same points he made today he was sharing with me. And it was it was actually a breath of fresh air to hear a person who matriculated through the NFL talent development system and was able to say, no, that was actually, I was preparing myself since six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven 10, 11 years old to go into the NFL. I think one thing that Brandon left out or missed out or, or didn't bring up uh, that he talked about with me was the coaches that he had along the way and how impactful they were to helping him to, to continue to develop his talent and to matriculate and to go to that next level. Now, we do understand with sports, there's a there's a element of God giftedness that goes into any athlete having the ability to play at the professional level. But when you, but, but there also, there is opportunities where there's a saying that me and my sons use is that hard work beats talent when talent doesn't work hard. We all have a level of talent and are gifted in some way, form or fashion. However, we have to work hard. And, and that is where I think the leadership model has so much applications because as Brandon and I spoke, it was him being able to understand what it did take to get to the next level. What did it take as a freshman in high school to become a starter in, by the end of his senior year of high school? But he was in high school, he's preparing himself so that he can uh, continue his career at the NCAA collegiate level. So he needed to know from ninth grade to 12th grade, what did that preparation look like? What did, what did it take to become that person so that upon in high school, he was ready for the industry that he wanted to go into. He was prepared to walk into that industry. That happened to be the NCAA. And when he got to the uh, uh, college and was playing, it was the University of Missouri brand. I don't want to, Called, Illinois. Uh, let's take your armor. Illinois. At the University of Illinois, he he knew what he had to do and he had to be prepared. But like you said, he had seniors, he had upperclassmen, he had coaches 
who said, if you want to continue your career at the next level, here are the things that we have to do. And it's those elements and those transferable skills uh, that I think are, are the, those transferable processes and lessons which are directly applicable to the apprenticeship industry and especially the youth apprenticeship industry. The other thing is that, you know, Brandon mentioned that there's a plethora of talent at the 15, 16, and 17 year old uh, level for, uh, for, for industries. The challenge and data has, and data has shown it, unfortunately, young people will begin to X themselves out of certain industries by fourth and fifth and sixth grade. So that's where I talk about employers having the investment because, and, and that's what really made the sports model to me, I called it the American apprenticeship model because truly it is. If you grow up in Cleveland, you are a Browns fan the minute you come out the womb. <laughs> you know, you get a Browns jersey, you get a Browns uh, a helmet, you get a Browns football. That's part of your birth package here in the Cleveland area. And I, I, I didn't grow up here. I've only lived here for 18 years, but I understand that. It's the brand. People buy into the brand. And, and it doesn't matter. Your teachers, they never, for the most part, teachers don't tell you, don't become a, a football player. They may say, hey, if football doesn't work out, you need a backup plan. But they don't tell you not to become one. Parents, Brandon mentioned that his parents drove him from Missouri to Colorado just for him to participate in probably a one-day camp. Might not even been a week-long camp, but it was a one-day camp that they had to drive to just for him to get that opportunity. Parents are invested in it. The community is invested in it. There's no reason why other industry sectors, if we can build that relationship pipeline with employers, that you can't make being a machinist at Lincoln Electric or Swage Lock, but those are two companies who are headquartered here in Cleveland, you can't make it just as sexy as as going into the NFL. And 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 look, I understand somebody's gonna say, well, nothing is as sexy as playing in the NFL versus working as a machinist. Let me understand. We have to, as we rethink talent development in our country, we have to say what is success for where a person is. Because it, to Brandon's point, if you're pursuing Major League Baseball, you can sit in the Major League Baseball farm system for 12 years and you're making less than a person working on a machine line at Lincoln Electric. You're making less than a person that decided to go into construction and uh, construction trades uh, right out of high school. You're making less than that person who decided to learn Cody in high school and got their Cisco uh, certification. You're chasing your dream. You're prepared. You are in your industry. But but monetarily, it doesn't mean that you're making um, the same because, it, it, you know, and that's where I, I think that we have to begin to have that conversation. So Brandon and I talked a lot about branding um, and why it, it works so well in our country with the sports model. So how do we then begin to articulate with our employer partners the same um, opportunities? Yeah, Deborah, and, and another part of that is when talking with businesses, it's you know, you have to trust the process. The The youth apprenticeship model is not intuitive for us here in the United States because we haven't been doing this for generations like like they have in Europe. So, you know, we're, we're, we're changing the apprenticeship from that old medieval model that we we're looking at apprenticeship through, and then we're applying it to white collar jobs here in Colorado. And what we're seeing is that um, the companies in Colorado are no longer seeing themselves as sitting on the sideline, uh, just the consumer of the education product. Um, the con we're having considerable uptake in the uh, youth apprenticeship model. So now what businesses are seeing themselves as, as not only the consumer, but they're also the producer. And, and it's because that they're, they're, they're working with us and developing the program, the custom programming. And you'll hear from, uh, from Mike a little later today with, with our, one of our pioneering partners here in Colorado, Cherry Creek School District. You know, we, they developed out a, a, a platform. We have 33 occupations at CareerWise. And uh, they developed uh, an additional occupation that didn't exist uh, to manage their fleet of vehicles for their entire school district um, and, and with youth apprenticeships. So there's flexibility within this model. It's, um, you know, this American uh, apprenticeship model. I love that you call it that, Dr. Robinson. I think that I, I think you're onto something there. But 
uh, to develop a, a pipeline, you know, stay the course, trust the process. You know, after a few series of unsuccessful, um, um, you know, a, a few series that are unsuccessful in the NFL, a coach just doesn't rip up the game plan and throw it out the window. You know, it's a, you know, trust the process uh, uh, and have a, a, a next player up mentality when it comes to uh, the youth apprenticeship model. Uh, keep inserting them and keep giving them opportunities. You know, Jack Ma talks about, uh, you know, it's important for a person, uh, you know, before they get to their 20s to just be around uh, a good boss, you know, like great leadership. And for businesses, that's you. You know, uh, Dr. Robinson pointed out that 95% of you played youth sports, you know, at some point in your life. And, you know, and at that pivotal time period in my life, when, you know, I was becoming a high school senior and my parents are model citizens, uh, I didn't want to hear from them. I didn't want to, they couldn't tell me anything about the direction college sports were going in. Uh, they couldn't tell me about how to become a professional athlete, but who inserted themselves in my life. Outside of my nuclear family was ball coaches, my track and field coach, my football coach. And, and so I've, I've kind of turned that Jack Ma quote around to it, you know, because in me, for me in my life, before my 20s, it was important for me to be around great coaches. And those are the ones who taught me humility. Those are the ones who taught me sportsmanship and class and, and how to um, uh, and how to handle myself on the field and off the field. And so for businesses, again, we're shifting that lens. Um, uh, we're, we're actually adding like an, another lens to, you know, apprenticeship where we're actually asking you to, you know, view yourself as the ball coach and the football coach, insert yourself in someone's life and make a huge difference. I, I love that, um, you know, description. And I was just actually in a meeting earlier today where we had to talk about our first job and sort of what it meant to us. And when I was a high school student, I mean, one of, I can tell you about the job and the tasks, but I was also talking about my supervisor and, you know, what I remember her interests. I remember, you know, a lot about her. And so, you know, I think that idea of really thinking of supervisors as coaches, particularly for youth, I mean, supervisors will always have an impact on their employees. But um, I love what you point out just about the moment in time that, you know, high school students are and, you know, developmentally, they're breaking away from their parents, right? So having another role model come in and have that be attached to a career pathway is a really powerful um, combination. And also just, you know, what you were talking about in terms of just the role of employers, you know, a lot that we hear from employers is, well, what if I invest in this apprentice and then they go and work for somebody else? But when you look at everything that you all have talked about from the major sports leagues, they're not expect, like the expectation is not even that the majority of people that they're investing in will come and work directly for their organization. It's that if you cultivate the best talent, you'll end up with the best talent. And that is worth it as an investment. And I think that's a really big shift um, you know, that idea, have faith in the model, right? It's a really big shift um, to have employers really think about the value of um, investing in that, that talent. And Terrence, when we spoke as you were writing this blog, um, you also talked about the links um, between the levels. And, and Brandon, you were talking about this a bit as well, but it works in part because every step in the pathway, people know very well what happens next and what happens, um, you know, to lead into it. And so that dialogue all across the chain makes it more seamless. And Terrence, something that um, you had mentioned was that, you know, the NFL also expects to find in industry innovation in the college level. And the college level may look to the best at what's happening in the high schools to find the, the latest and greatest in a game as well. So it's not just that employers are trying to communicate down and they see themselves as like givers of information. They see the value already in the talent that has yet to come up. Um, so I just, I thought that was a really important point as you were developing all of this. And it um, gave me some insight into sort of why you were doing all of this, but I'd love to hear from you. Like, you know, why do you think it's important for people really to, to think about this analogy. And what do you, you know, you said a little bit of what got you started on the idea, but you know, what was really missing in the system 
why why should people really take these lessons to heart? Well, when I first started on the idea and the concept, it was uh, late 2018, early 2019, I believe. Uh, and what has happened since then, the pandemic, has forced us to kind of reexamine all of our systems. Um, we are in a very unique space. But as I look at talent development, I, I look at it because as I was building up the pre-apprenticeship program in manufacturing, I had to very much deal and confront that there were certain um, racial inequities and biases uh, built into the system, the traditional manufacturing apprenticeship system. And I'm only talking about manufacturing because that's the industry I worked in, but there were uh, resistance um, and, and racial you know, biases uh, that was a part of their system or was considered to be a part of their culture and other uh, parents and grandparents of students who were in high school were very disenfranchised with sending their young African-American uh, son or daughter, their young Hispanic son or daughter into a manufacturing environment because they heard the stories of what their uh, grandfathers and grandparents had to face going into there. What I found when I built out the system, and I'm not, I'm not saying it was not still because we had to do a lot of cultural uh, unconscious and conscious bias training. We had to really start working with uh, the manufacturers. The benefit was it was a top-down push, meaning the CEOs of some of the bigger uh, manufacturing companies was at the table. They were working with their frontline managers who were very key, uh, and, and, and I can't stress that. Uh, Brandon, talk about coaches. Frontline managers are your coaches. They're your position coaches. They are the ones that are, are cultivating your talent. But even sometimes, like he said, in his first year in the NFL, he had a senior, a more senior successful employee that was in front of him, That, but he did not show him the proper etiquette and the proper way. So you, you basically, he had a superstar employee that was probably would never make it to management, but he was a great employee, should never be a trainer. <laughs> and and those was, those was, that was something conceptual that I that I picked up on, but what I noticed when I st when we built out this program, and we actually put young people, kids, sixteen year old kids, in front of the senior, it uh, 40, 40 year thirty year manufacturers, they welcomed it. They were like, oh my god, the pipeline. I don't care. Black, white, brown, we just need you here. I, like I said, I'm not saying that this is a cure-all, but what I found was that as they saw the talent supply chain needing to be becoming more diverse, it worked a lot easier and a lot better for young people to come into these industries, and they had a lot of help. So I started, you know, from, from I, they were willing, I, I should say they had a lot of help, they were very willing to support young people to become successful as, as, as future machinists, as future laborers, as future uh, employees within their manufacturing organizations. And so what I started understanding, that's why I say it's a, it, this is a systems change. This is how we start to look at talent development. It's the supply chain. It is employers have to understand where their supply chain starts. Every or every industry has a supply, has a product manufacturing supply chain, uh, whether it's uh, IT or whatever. But now we're talking about talent. So where does your talent supply chain begin? And your talent supply chain, our education system in America, is our talent development system. So as Brandon alluded, cons employers can no longer sit on the sideline and be consumers. They have to be active partners in developing the talent that they want to see come into their workforce because you can no longer continue to blame colleges and universities and high schools and technical schools and community colleges for not producing the talent when all when you have not taken the time to partner to invest to say hey you know our businesses change at the speed of light these are the skill sets that are constant Here's the ad adaptability uh, quotient that individuals need to have coming into our industry. Here's how we help uh, employees uh, coming on develop that. And looking all the way back into our middle school and our K through 12 system is where 
um, I started seeing uh, having that conversation, and I think it will help with many of our diversity issues, many of our systemic issues, because our talent supply chain is made up of, of young men and young women, uh, black, brown, um, white, it doesn't matter. These young people are eager for opportunities. And, and, uh, and I think when you start to really look at it from a talent supply chain, you're already baking diversity in your talent supply chain. You're already baking gender diversity in your talent supply chain. Because as you look at young people, you're not, you're gonna, you're gonna have a, 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 a diverse basket of young people to, to choose from, but you're helping to develop at the skill set that you're interested in. So for me, it was, uh, you know, it became something that as the talent gap um, became the number one issue that most employers face, I began to understand that talent was the only competitive advantage any American company would have. Therefore, how do we really create a talent development system that works? And, and like I said, I did a lot of research around it. There's only one industry that I found that have, uh, to, to Brandon's point, it's 5,000 people a year beating down the door to try to become a um, NFL player and the same for basketball and the same for Major League Baseball. That's, that's amazing. Thank you so much. And we're about to turn to hear from a couple of practitioners for how these lessons really can apply. But I'd like to give you each just 30 seconds um, when you think about practitioners who are, you know, working in the youth apprenticeship space, um, is there a final thought or idea that you would like to them to carry forward with them? Um, Brandon, I'll, I'll turn to you first. Yes, I, you know, I'd just say, you know, as we're, as our leaders step forward and put their businesses up um, and, and offer these new opportunities to a new pool of talent, you know, if our assumptions are right about the motivation of the adult workforce, uh, our political systems in flux, our uh, economic systems in flux, you know, capitalism, what is it, what is it, what is it, what isn't it? Um, there's a, a pool of individuals who are ready and willing to get into the workforce. And I say, offer, the, offer them those opportunities and uh, and that's the point, you know, we're pointing towards a more equitable, inclusive economy. And that's what's going to keep us competitive on a global stage. And that's what's also going to lower the barriers for uh, economic uh, mobility and get more people into a middle class. And that's um, and that's what's going to help our um, our society as a whole. Great. And Terrence? Yeah, uh, I will keep it sweet and, and brief. Uh, we have to look at talent development as a as a regional, um, a, re a local, a regional, a state issue. Uh, I don't think that there's anything we can do at the federal level to really begin to alter how we develop talent in this country and address many of the um, uh, uh, skills gap and the talent shortages. But what regions can do is say, what are our five demand industries? How do we develop talent? so that we can produce the talent for those five high demand industries that we have here. Because if you start producing talent for those five high demand industries, I promise you the skill sets that they will learn will transfer to, to some of the sub industries that are supporters to those high demand industries, because they're gonna learn certain skill sets that can be transferable. And, what's, and what we have to be able to do, especially if we have any employers on the line, is and, and and I understand the automated HR system. It helps to eliminate and helps to make your job easier, but it does not have it intuitive where it can characterize or catalog transferable skills. You are missing out on so many individuals, young people, because I also work in the adult workforce area. But you're missing out on so many, so much talent that has transferable skills because our computerized systems. Does not does not know how to see a skill set, see a person's job experience, and say, oh, they would be perfect for this position because the skill sets are the same. So it's a regional, in my opinion, it's a regional and state efforts that have to change, and we have to do a better job with uh, articulating and understanding transferable skills from industries to industry. Great. 
I feel like you, uh, like we set that up, even though we didn't, because it's a perfect segue to hearing from people really doing this work locally on the ground. Um, thank you both so much for joining. As always, I learned a lot from listening to you. Um, I look forward actually to listening to this again so I can pick up on so many of the things that um, you were saying so I can continue to process it. Um, and now we'll turn um, to the second conversation of um, today, really hearing what's happening on the ground. So um, we will hear from Andrea Buenano, um, who is an assistant professor of sport administration at the University of Cincinnati. Um, and she oversees a lot of the experiential learning courses um, and related activities for undergraduates in their sports admin program, um, as well as Mike Wadley, who um, Brandon mentioned earlier, um, is an apprenticeship coordinator at Cherry Creek School District, which is in Colorado. Um, and he leads youth apprenticeship programs there, again, in a variety of sectors. Um, so um, we're, I'm really looking forward to hearing from both of you. You both have a lot of experience, you know, in this um, field. And first, I'd just like to turn it to you, Mike. Um, you know, are there one or two ways that you really see this framing of major league sports as a youth apprenticeship that can lead to some change in your own um, apprenticeship work? Yeah, yeah. First, thanks, uh, JFF and, and this amazing group of people. It's been great talking about this, uh, you know, this, this situation. And, and um, yeah, and, and like Brandon mentioned, in, in the addition to the automotive technician apprenticeship, we actually have just launched our first Department of Labor recognized apprenticeship um the future educator pathway which is training future teachers in our district and and i think you know one of the things that that really really stands out to me and and you know hearing dr robinson and brandon talk about this idea of transferable skills and mentors and, and things like that 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 we get you know when we look at youth sports and and everyone that's participated in youth sports those skills that we gain um, through those experiences, um, what we're finding is that our, our apprentices are actually gaining those same skills just in a different way. And, um, you know, you know, they continue to refer to transferable skills. One thing that, you know, we've kind of identified in our school district that we kind of look at is post um, post secondary and workforce readiness skills, which have been identified by the Colorado Department of Education, which is a, a set of skills that, you know, we've heard over and over again from employers that they're looking for. And, and, and young people to become, you know, the next generation of, of talent that's coming into the workforce. And those are those exact same skills that, um, you know, that, that Brandon and Dr. Robinson were both mentioning, um, you know, and, and we, we're finding that most of our students that, um, you know, become apprentices and work with our, our local companies are gaining those skills, um, you know, and, and it's, it's, it's great to see the maturity from the students that, you know, when they start out as a, as a youth apprentice, um, you know, when they're 16 years old, when they leave and, you know, to the Cherry Creek School District um, at 18, just the way they mature and, and the, the skill set that they've they've gained by being an apprentice. And and I think, you know, one of the, the big things that I was taking notes and I, you know, my pen was just running out of ink left and right was talking about the mentorship piece. Um, you know, and I think as an educator, we tell students, you know, every single day, hey, these are the skills that you need. These are the skills that you need. To be successful in, in any sort of career field that you want to go into and, and it's almost like a, when your parents tell you that same thing over and over again it becomes just something they hear but they don't really you know understand or, or don't really want to listen to so when they go out and they spend time with these mentors and and really work on these skills um, that we're talking about um, they hear it loud and clear from those companies. You know, they hear it loud and clear from their mentors and their mentors demonstrate those things. And, and it's all those those skills that, you know, that we talk about that we're, we're expecting from our youth to just know. Um, where do they get those skills? You know, I, I got mine from youth sports, um, you know, different students and different people get them from different places. But, you know, our students in apprenticeship are gaining those skills um, through the apprenticeship. And, and the other thing that really stood out to me was this mentorship piece is I think, you know, as I reflect on, you know, kind of what Terrence was saying about, you know, I, I gave my, um, you know, my sons and my daughters, you know, soccer balls, footballs and things like that. Right. At some point, if if you don't have that connection, if your student, you know, or, or your your son or daughter goes into a career field that you're maybe not comfortable with, they can find a mentor in that career field that really they're passionate about and they find those connections and they're really going to gain those skills that they um, that they've talked about. So, I, I, you know, I see this parallel that, that, that Dr. Robinson created is, is such a 
you know, a way that we can put it into practice and that we understand as, as you know, as a society. And again, um, you know, I, we've, we've referred to it as the American apprenticeship over and over again. And, you know, I think that's that's a really a good way to, to, to kind of frame it because it's just not something that we're used to in this country of really putting students um, in a situation to succeed as apprentices in, in, in really work-based learning altogether. Great, thanks. And Andrea, so Mike, you know, brings that high school perspective, but as we talked about with sports, um, you know, the pathway really continues, um, you know, through post-secondary and that's where you're working. So do you see any differences um, in what resonates with this or any differences in how to apply it once you're working at that college level? Um, well, uh, like Mike said, thank you, JFF, for having me and um, the great group of people that we've been working with. But, you know, when when Mike and I actually had a great conversation as well, but when it comes to post-secondary and it comes to, you know, intercollegiate, you know, students, I don't think that there's much uh, applications that are dissimilar to what Mike was referring to. I think those same applications, those transferable skills that you often get in sport through the youth apprenticeship are similar to what students would get in an internship or so, or you know a capstone or something like that but you know I, I think the youth apprenticeship model could assist collegiate by the time you get to a, you know a collegiate student having some of those you know two or three apprenticeships might be useful you know, often students are changing their majors a few times because they're just not getting a hold on what they really or truly are passionate about or want to do. So, and a lot of industries are cutthroat, as, as you all know, sports is cutthroat and, and, you know, and so forth. So it's hard to get in a lot of these industries, having that youth apprenticeship model, that work-based learning model is extremely helpful before you get to college. Sometimes we have students and, and Mike can probably attest and Dr. Robinson that, you know, by the time they get to college, they have no idea, they don't have experience. And so it's it's really important for us to invest at the youth level so that when they get to college, one, you're not wasting money, as as you all know, sometimes you have to go further, but that we're really investing and in, in building those diverse opportunities for, you know, our youth to go and, and be a part of the society and, and be a part of an industry that they're really interested in. And you're really working with students um, in a, a broad range of talent development across across sports, um, you know, not exclusively in this um, pathway that we've talked about. So I'm just curious if you have any other lessons that you've seen um, in your work in sports that you think could be applied more broadly across sectors. Yeah, um, so specifically when it comes to the industry, I think uh, Dr. Robinson was uh, in, in his blog, he pointed out that there is this cultural relevance that that is pointed out in sports and, and is pointed to sports. And like sports, many industry, there's not this, um, well, sports has a farm system and a lot of other system or industries don't have this farm system that they were talking about earlier. So you know, as it pertains to sports, it's very linear when you want to become a pitcher, right? You get a pitching coach, you go to the MLB camps, same thing with a quarterback and those types of things. So, you know, industries need to invest and not be so linear in that approach. And that includes, you know, sports looking into this K through 12 system. And I think we talked about this, that, you know, you'll see majors online or you love sports. Here's the list of careers that you can have in, in sports. And a if you go into a, co a college level, one of those is not going to point to you being professional athlete if you're going to get a degree in it. Can you? Yes. Um, but it's usually not one of those jobs. So more broadly, um, here's what you can do. But if we start at the K through 12 level, you know, that allows young, you know, youth to look at the industry, not just from a linear standpoint and becoming this very small sector of, of the industry in itself that we all see. Uh, just like in healthcare, right? The doctors and the nurses is what we see uh, straight up front. Um, so with sports, there's so many different entities that youth can get involved in. And really, you know, from a marketing standpoint, even being a chef of a team or, you know, a, a strength and conditioning coach or sales, something that they're passionate about. And maybe you, you get burned out with sports, but you still love sports, so you can still get involved in these industries. And I think um, most of all what Dr. Robinson was talking about, expanding opportunities and, and 
um, you know, especially for minorities, uh, you know, as it pertains to race and gender and, um, you know, individuals with disabilities as well. So I think having those models early on can be um, applied generally to the talent development pool. And I think sports does a really good job at framing that at the small level of be becoming a professional athlete, but it's also an entire industry that has all these different opportunities that you can do and be exposed to at a at an early age, which would increase the diversity and I think enhance the industry as a whole, mainly mainly like others. Yeah, I think I think that's a great point. You know, there's a there's a visible part to um, the sports industry that can serve as a hook to a really broad range of careers, and and we can think about that. Yeah, for other industries as well, there might be a hook, but somebody can still end up in the industry doing something. Um, else that, you know, really ultimately is what matches their their interests best. Um, so, Mike, I want to turn to you. Um, this is a big sort of attitude shift, the way that we've been talking about it. You know, where do you see that the change that's needed to get to this kind of model in other sectors as you're working, you know, across sectors? What would employers or educators um, need to think about as the first thing to sort of spark that change? Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, Brandon mentioned it just this this way of, you know, education has been thinking for years. And so I think really what it starts with is uh, is creative leadership. And and so I have to give a lot of credit to Sarah Grobel, our assistant superintendent, who worked closely with CareerWise. You know, she kind of is the creative mind behind all this is taking these ideas and saying, you know what, we're going to make this work no matter what. We're going to figure out a way, a way to make students schedules work. Um, we're going to figure out a way to get their graduation credits, you know, so it's, it's really the creative thinking, but it's also willing to take a risk, um, you know, not only from an education standpoint, standpoint, but also from a parent standpoint and from a mentor standpoint. And I think, um, you know, 1 thing Dr. Robinson mentioned was this, you know, this idea of bringing um, youth into these industry sectors and, and seeing just. Um, the excitement from these mentors, you know, these people have been with the with the industry for 25 and 30 years. You know, we went into Aero um, Electronics and, and and met with people, and they're like, these young people are bringing such an energy to our, um, you know, to our industry that we haven't seen, and, and they're contributing, they're doing all these things. So really, um, you know, it's it's a risk, um, it's being creative, but I I think that one thing that that everyone learns in this process is that it can be done, and it's. It's worth it because the kids are getting the skills that that we want them to get, but also um, the companies are becoming those producers that Brandon mentioned. Great, and I can't believe how quickly this hour is going, but I'd like to give you each um, a chance to, you know, provide any final thoughts or reflections before we have to wrap up. Um, Andrea, why don't I turn to you first? No, uh, thank you. Uh, you know, and thank you for Dr. Robinson for writing a blog that a lot of us are connected to and and have been probably talking about and thinking about and coming, you know, putting that into fruition. But I, I'm just excited. I, I think the expansion of talent development, you know, like Dr. Robinson said, provides opportunity in, you know, that early exposure, building those skills, the specialized training that youth can get. I think if we really invested in our youth, uh, you know, at the K through 12 level that we would see more of those leaders and we would see more opportunities that uh, lie within all the industries. And so, you know, I think the outlook would be fantastic. Great. Thank you. And Mike. Yeah, I, I would, I agree with Andrea. I think that, you know, Dr. Robinson, thanks for writing the blog. I think it's something we can all, you know, wrap our minds around and, and understand a little bit because it's something we're familiar with when, you know, youth apprenticeship isn't, um, you know, the most familiar thing. And, and so, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm really excited. I'm, I'm really excited to work with companies like CareerWise and, um, and, and, you know, Brandon to, to really kind of push this, um, this idea of the, the modern youth apprenticeship forward. So it's just really cool for me to see these kids just grow um, from the time they leave, you know, you know, high school and become apprentices and then become, you know, members of these, these amazing companies that have, that have taken the risks. So I'm, I'm super excited to see where this goes. And I just want to say thanks to everybody. This has been super fun. Well, thank you both so much. Um, and thank you to all of our speakers. Um, and, um, you know, JFF was really excited to be a part of this discussion. Um, thank you all for everyone who joined. I um, was going to wrap things up and there was, there's so many ideas that I don't know that I can um, have a really concise wrap up, but I do think, you know, a few takeaways from today. Um, one was just really thinking about 
um, somebody's whole trajectory, you know, from a, a really young youth um, all the way up through adulthood, but that this space when youth apprenticeship happens is an especially critical moment. Um, and so really thinking about how coaches, how frontline supervisors, how, you know, teachers and employers can really shape um, the direction and career trajectory of a student at that point um, is something that, you know, the, the sports industry has really succeeded in. Um, and just the importance of an inclusive work culture um, and and how a company brands themselves and really shows um, students and young people that they can be a part of it. And so to what um, Brandon was saying and Andrea was saying about you know, all there are all different kinds of opportunities across the industry for people um, to really see themselves in. And then finally, that point around diversity, equity, and inclusion. And you know, the sports industry is not the only one that's been um, facing diversity, equity, and inclusion issues over the years. And they've made a lot of progress um, in bringing in a more diverse talent pool. Um, and as they and all sectors continue to work at it, having a strategy like youth apprenticeship. Um, you know, really can be a powerful tool in starting to change um, both the face of our industries and then also how um, inclusive those industries are of the workers once they're in them. Um, and, you know, thank you again to everyone. Um, I hope that this is the beginning of a conversation among everybody who's listening about um, really how we can advance youth apprenticeship um, and how we can bring it to the next level, how we can continue to learn from sports, uh, the sports industry as we really turn youth apprenticeship into a mainstream um, model across the country. So thank you all.